As I uh, mentioned last night, the uh, Parsha deals with the mitzvah of Kiddush HaChodesh, the establishment of the Jewish calendar. So I'd like to add to uh, what I said last night to you and give it a sort of an historical perspective as well. In the uh, Gemara in Rosh Hashanah teaches us that uh, the uh, Sanhedrin in Yerushalayim, which declared when Rosh Chodesh was, and as I explained to you, sometimes they declared it, uh, they declared it on the basis of witnesses, but sometimes they adjusted it uh, depending on how it had to be uh, in order to reconcile itself to the actual uh, astronomical calendar. So they had to have a method of communicating their uh, decision to the Jews who lived in, especially in Bovel, because that was the uh, main uh, site of the exile. The other site of the exile was Egypt. But apparently the Egypt, it was close enough that uh, somehow they could get messengers there. But to Bovel, it was a further distance. So the Gemara says they had a system of uh, bonfires on top of tall peaks. There were seven mountains that were established. And one of them you can see if you drive up the Jordan Valley. Sarbata is there. Uh, yeah. So on top of that peak, which overlooks the entire area, so they lit a bonfire, and then people saw the bonfire, and they lit the second, the third, all the way, and the Gemara says, Atsheir, Heir, Pnei Kol until it was, uh, the entire horizon was alight with uh, these bonfires, and therefore the Jews in Bovel knew that they had declared that night to be the beginning of Ishkodesh. Then the Gemara says that they stopped that. Mishakil Kalu Abzdukim. Now the Abzdukim were uh, very powerful uh, and numerous sect that existed from uh, the time of the Hashmanoim onwards who opposed rabbinic Judaism. And they uh, many times even gained control of the Beit HaMikdash. We find that uh, before Yom Kippur, the Gemara and Yoma teaches us that the Chachamim had to give an oath to the Kohen Gadol that he would perform properly because there was a difference of opinion between the Tzdokim and the Prushim as to how the Avoda should be conducted. So the Zdokim were a potent force, and they opposed the Rabbonin. They opposed Rabbinic Judaism in all of its forms. And they made an alternate. They had their own, uh, their own brand. And today we call it pluralism. They do what they want. So they purposely sabotaged this system of the bonfires. They would light the bonfires on the wrong night, or they would extinguish the bonfires once they were lit, so that the rabbis could no longer rely upon it. And to a great extent, that is what created for us the uh, second day of Yontiv in the exile, because of the fact that the uh, messengers from the Sanhedrin could not reach Bovel in time, and therefore they would not know which day was Pesach, or etc. So therefore, that's why the idea of uh, Yontav Sheni Shogolius entered. And it's interesting that that's always the thing that's opposed even today is the Antif Shani. Because again, that was a rabbinic thing, and uh, it's Minigavasenu Biyodenu. 
Okay, so now uh, let's go forward another uh, few hundred years. And then now there's a great dispute again regarding the calendar. Uh, there was a Rav in Yerushalayim he was, uh, in the uh, ninth century, in the, in the 800s. His name was Ben Meir. He was a great Tamar Chacham. And he was, uh, <coughs> excuse me, he was the titular head of uh, the Bezdin in Yerushalayim. And he was an astronomer and the mathematician. And he made the calculations and he said the rabbinic calendar is wrong. It's not accurate to what the actuality is and that they're off uh, by the Molod uh, close to 18 hours. And therefore he said that in this and this year Pesach begins on, uh, let's say, on Monday, and the Chachomim said Pesach begins on Tuesday. And since uh, everybody always has a following, so in that year, there were Jews that ate Chomets Pesach, depending whose opinion you were, you were holding. And this continued for about three years. And it was a major dispute in the Jewish world. Uh, his main antagonist, uh, the one that represented the rabbinic tradition, was Rabbeinu Sadia Gon, who was a uh, polemicist who wrote and who uh, took up the, the war. So he took up the war against the Karoyim, and he took up the war against Ben Meir. And he also took up the war against the, the uh, Gaonic leadership of his time in Bovel. He was all of his life involved in controversies. But he uh, wrote extensively to disprove the thesis of Ben Meir and that the uh, rabbinic calendar was the accurate calendar and that that was the one to be followed. And after about four or five years, the Machokas died out, and uh, the mayor no longer was alive, and the uh, calendar as we have it today uh, was judged to be correct, and that became the ruling calendar uh, from then on. In the later times, so uh, part of the, in, in the, uh, in the uh, false messiah of Shab uh, Tzvi, which was a tremendously tragic event in Jewish history, so he also attempted to adjust the calendar. But he didn't do it on the basis of mathematics. He said he had revelation. Now, you can't argue with someone who says he has revelation, right? Because how do you disprove it? But then later on, when he uh, became an apostate, so it became obvious that anything that he said was not to be taken seriously, certainly not in Jewish life. And uh, the calendar was again reestablished. Then the uh, second time it happened, uh, uh, 60 years later in Poland, there was another uh, false messiah of, uh, movement of a man by the name of Jakob Frank. They were the Frankistin. Eventually they all ended up converting to Catholicism. But for a while they were also uh, popular, you, you know that, I don't know how to put it uh, nicely, but uh, anything that's new, you know, oh, that's good, that's going to do it, right? I mean, that's why we have all these new political parties also. 
deep down in your heart, you know that it's useless. But you know, it's new, you know, new people, maybe they have a better idea. So uh, that always existed. And they always tinkered with the calendar. And the calendar was the, uh, the focal point of uh, changing. In the uh, 19th century, when reform took over in Germany, there was a great discussion amongst reformed Jews, the reform rabbis, what to do with the calendar. And interestingly enough, they retained the traditional calendar, though they did away with the second day of Yom Tov. I notice in the United States that those that don't keep the second day don't keep the first day either. <laughs> Which is a uh, natural outgrowth of uh, such uh, policies. But they decided that they would keep the traditional calendar, even though there was a movement not to do so. And as I mentioned to you, the uh, French mm -hmm. Revolution was so radical that they wanted to change all calendars. And they wanted to have a 10-day week and a 10-month year and all sorts of radical changes that, uh, again, it didn't take hold. In the uh, rise of the Soviet Union, <clears throat> in the atheism that it practiced and enforced, especially against the Jews. Uh, having a Jewish calendar was an offense, a criminal offense. Rabbi Tights told me, uh, uh, Rabbi Tights was active in the early 1960s with uh, Soviet Jewry. So he was able to, through uh, political connections uh, in the United States that uh, had influence in Russia, he was able that the Russian government allowed him to bring in Sidurim, prayer books, uh, in Hebrew. And it said that the, in the, in the uh, title page, it said, this Sidur is for tourists only. But uh, once the book gets in, it gets in. And then he tried to do something else. He tried to print calendars and bring the calendars in, and that they did not allow. They allowed uh, prayer books, but they did not allow calendars because they had the sense of the matter that somehow if the Jews had the Jewish calendar, it would still remain Jewish. And that really was the secret for Soviet Jewry, is that they somehow they knew when Simchas Torah was. So the 50,000 Jews gathered in Moscow in front of the Coral Synagogue because with Simchas, they didn't know what Simchas Torah was, but they knew that Simchas Torah existed and that that was the day. And uh, the, uh, the Soviet Union at attempted to destroy the Jewish people by uh, banning the calendar. I uh, seeing that the Jewish calendar shouldn't exist because the rhythm of Jewish life is based on the calendar. It's based on the, the holidays of the year. There's a, there's a uh, it's like a musical symphony. There, it's a, there's a rhythm to the Jewish year. I mean, now we're coming to Shvat, and it'll be Tu Shvat, and then we'll come door and we'll come, and, you know, you're always going ahead. It's Purim, it's Pesach, it's going to be. And uh, they realize that. So throughout uh, the Jewish history, we have seen that the Jewish calendar is central to Jewish life. And perhaps that's one of the reasons why the Torah emphasizes <laughs> it so. The first mitzvah of the Torah, Chodesh Hazel Lachem, we would say the first mitzvah is or other things that, uh, that are me'ikre adas, that are part of the foundation of Judaism. And here we're talking about a calendar. But the calendar is the secret of our survival. And therefore, by having it and knowing it, 
and nurturing it and preserving it, so that contributes to the eternity of Klal Yisrael. Thank you.